He's definitely lifting off the gas you know, before he gets on the brakes in that car. So you know, he's just coasting down to the end of the straight. Uh, he, that's a trick he learned, of course, in, in Chap Car. Someone's off the road, aren't they? Just dropping a wheel off, I think, there. So, you know, he, he's definitely still in fuel safe mode. You know, he, he, he had to go just about to the car's limit to get to the end of the race on this final stint of fuel. 23 seconds to Frank Montani. And when they come round again, this time we'll give you the gap again. I'll say what I said earlier on. Somewhere in the centre of England, adjacent to Bambury and Gibb, one George Howard Chapel and David Richards are going to be looking at the performance of Simon Pagino, David Brabham, Marino Franchini and the rest of the Highcroft team against the new Peugeots. The new Peugeot is behind the petrol engine car. Now, yes, there's been problems, but they are there on merit. They are there on tactical nous, and they are there, Jeremy, on whatever anybody else says, ahead of this car on pace. Yeah, but uh, that, that, that lap around, Frank Montani pulled in Simon Pagano by almost three seconds on that one lap. We've got, what, 32 minutes to go, so about 60 laps here. It might come down to when, actually, you know, when they cross the finish line to take the white flag in this race, you know, depending well, on, on how many laps they have to do to get to the end of the race. Well, remember that fantastic finish in GT that had uh, Ferrari and uh, Porsche battling around the 12 hours that had lapped some time before, but exactly that, the leaders hadn't passed them, so they effectively got an extra lap. And there was a Petit Le Mans, I can remember, as well. Petit Le Mans last year for you. Exactly right. One less lap, and it would have been a completely different story for the race, for the championship, even in GT. Yeah, indeed. Pagino now minus 32 to Loic Duval and plus 20 and a half yeah. to Frank Montani. As I said, he pulled in almost three seconds on that one lap, did Frank Montani. Half so an hour. Half an hour, so it's what, 15, 16 laps. You know, he it's can catch him. Do that. He can definitely catch him. It's only just over a second a lap. The only thing about that is if Montani passes Pagino, I really hope that Deshaunak is not told to give up the win to Peugeot. Yeah, true. Yeah, we said a while ago, didn't we? You know, there's definitely three cars still in this motor race. It's looking good for Lloyd Duval. Dindu Capello makes his last pit stop in the number two Audi. Let's have a word for Audi Sport. Not a clean race for them. And problems for both the two and the one car. But they battle back from way down. And they've pretty much kept the distance between themselves and the leaders. Their pace in that revamped R15 has been good to Loic Duval in the 10 car, which we're watching now. And there he is in the darkness. And that is Dindo Capello having just come out of the pit lane for the final time. I think Audi will be relatively heartened by this, Jeremy, to be honest. Yes, they're not getting full points. It's uh, Alan McNish doing the last stint in the car. Surprise. Uh, <laughs> 22 seconds of fuel and a change from Dindo to Al. I think they'll be relatively hard at this, as I say. The revamped R15 has by no means let itself down. Many of the problems that we've seen were not of their making contact, particularly with this car, when the car was uh, sitting relatively pretty in the top three of the race, Jeremy, and when Dindor was attacked. Yep, very much so. And uh, your last lap around, you know, the, the cars have been doing 51s and 52s pretty happily, 50s on occasion, certainly, uh, and it has been very, very competitive. Year-old car it might be, heavily restricted it might be, but it's still competitive. And that's what the ACO was trying to achieve with its new rules for 2011. Competitive, but not too competitive. Uh, Alexander Wirtz in the seven car, who was the he wasn't the driver but it was the seven car that was involved with uh, Dindo they've worked their way back up to eighth position now although quite a few laps further down now on board with Romain Dumas he's did a cracking job out there in the darkness he and Timo Bernard have been a great sports car pairing for quite some time further up the road Pagino is losing time again. Ah, but Montani yeah. is as well, and the rock has been stopped for at least one lap. From Simon Pagino as Frank Montani hits traffic. Montani 
17 behind. He's still catching him, but the rate that he's catching him has slowed down a little bit as Montani hits a bit of traffic himself. That's right, caught him by only one tenth of a second. That lap had been a couple of seconds or more the previous two laps, and you know that's what it's going to come down to. That the traffic and when the uh, when they take the white flag to begin their final lap around this 3.7 mile circuit, I've not got the uh, mental capacity to be able to figure out exactly when that check of you know, when that white flag is going to fall and how many laps they are going to have to do to the end of this race the engineers will know that um i don't have under enough computers or brain power but it's you know it's, it doesn't matter really it's still fascinating stuff frank monty Tanny is driving flat out if he hadn't changed tires on that final stint you know he'd, he'd, pro now he'd be probably, in second he probably would be, be in second place he would be yeah doubtless he may still do it absolutely right the, the thing about that, if he hadn't, yeah. ooh, I don't know. If and ands, let's leave that yeah, on one great. side. Brilliant. Please, please, please. If well, I'm sure Persia aren't listening to us, but I really hope they don't. If Montani looks like he might well catch Pagano, if he does, I really hope they don't Thank pull. You. To foul back to him. I don't think they would. Uh, there's a quick lap from Lloyd Duval, 150.55. <laughs> Good lad for our race leader. 51-9 for Simon Pagano, so that gap extends a little bit by a second or so, but still a good lap there by Simon Pagano. That's his fastest for some time, Jeremy. Got down under 52. Yep. As we're watching Alan McNish coming towards us yep. with the uh, yellow he LEDs. out a little bit over Frank Montani on that lap, so Simon Pagano stemmed the tide over the last two laps. From Mont Frank Montani 152.0, Pagano 1, 1 minute 51.9, and Lloyd Duval quickest of all at 150.5. Now here's a problem for Frank Montani, and I know now why his lap times have changed. He's got stuck in behind one of the Audis, ah. and they're not letting him by. And why should they? They're in their own race. And don't forget, they want to keep him back down in third position so that they get more points in terms of a, a gap. Yeah, they keep the points gap down as low as possible. Oh. McNish at the moment is only one place behind Montani in terms of point scoring, and he will not want Montani to go past him and set about the back of Simon Pagano's car. So this is another nuance. And remember, Peugeot played the team game in Zuhai and the last race of last year when they used the second car to stop Christensen gaining on ah. the Peugeot at the end of the race, so the, there's a bit of payback coming here. Let's go down to pit lane, to Highcroft and to Kelly Stavist. Well, David Brabham certainly did his job. Now he's just looking on and cheering on his teammate Simon Pagano. But what are your thoughts here, David, as you watch these final 25 minutes? Well, I mean, it's been a fantastic race, hasn't it? I mean, it's just been full on the whole uh, 12 hours. I mean, the, the Highcroft team has just done a fantastic job. HBD and uh, Words Research, Michelin, all our partners uh, to come here at the beginning of the week with a car never turned to wheels, brand new, and to go through the race like we have is just unbelievable. We assume that Simon's now in a, in a fuel conservation mode. He's losing a little bit of time. Do you know at all the fuel situation and, and do you have confidence that you guys can pull out a miracle here? Well, I think we might need a miracle to win. But, um, you know, we've been trying to save fuel for some time and get as much as we can, obviously, for this sort of stage of the race. So Simon's doing a fantastic job out there. I mean, it's, I know it's not easy to go out there and push as hard as you can and try and save fuel at the same time, but he's doing a great job. When you guys showed up here with a brand new car five days ago, though, did you think you'd be in this situation where you were looking for the overall win? Well, I think we were hoping, but, um, you know, it seemed a long, long way away, that's for sure. Thanks, David. Right, thanks. He doesn't look relaxed at all, Bob's no. there, does he? He's like, can't, neither does you, does Shodak, sitting with his arms crossed on the perch. Olivier Paddy to his left, the right of the screen. Just a couple of moments ago. <laughs> well, Every picture tells a story. He's got the white face Daytona Rolex on there, appropriate look for the ILMC. And he was saying a little prayer, looking at his watch. As Loic Duval holds on. I don't think Duval has got to worry about Pagano no. as we look down no, from no. the Porsche helicam. It's, it's Montani who's gaining now on Pagano. 
No, all he's got to work, oh, Lloyd Duval just has to keep his eyes ahead of himself, make sure he, he anticipates what's coming up ahead of him in terms of traffic particularly, just don't make a mistake and he will bring oh. the car home. And I say that in a 51-9 from Pagano, but the gap has gone out to 39 seconds between first and second now. Montani down to 15 and a half. What I haven't seen is whether he's got past Alan McNish yet. No, he has not. No. So McNish is holding him back as they go across the line. McNish at 115.5. That's not... That is not what Simon Pagino and Duncan Dayton, Alan McNish, has speeded up. And Montani only did a 52-1 there. So it's yeah, McNish again, beginning to gab him. Yeah, once again, he lost a couple of tenths of the second there, Frank Montagny, to Simon Pagano in that battle for second place. Oh, my goodness me. Let's take our mind off that for, for a couple of minutes. Let's look into GT. Still Joey Hand by about uh, 42 or oh. 3 seconds over Dirk Werner. And then Tommy Milner's about another five seconds back in the Corvette in third place. David Faulkner still leads in GT Challenge for Black Swan Racing, and they got a, 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 a lead of, again, right about a lap over Spencer Pampelli for the racing group. Oh, nice, they put Falk there, they put Demo in for the end. That's a nice touch, he qualified the car, he did a great stint in the middle of the race, getting them a lap back, putting him in a position now. There were some of their competitors had uh, problems around them, including a four minute stop and go for one of uh, the leaders and a puncture in an opportune moment. Not that it was ever an opportune moment for a puncture, but uh, you know what I mean? But they were there and they picked up the pieces. We haven't talked about G GTE, the amateur class, yeah. for a long while. Tracy Crone, that's off to Crone Racing, car number 57, that bright green Ferrari. They've held off a pretty stout challenge, particularly from the. Proton, uh, yeah. from the Proton guys. Absolutely yeah. right, with Richard Lights and. Uh, Gianluca Roda, yep. and they're a good team. Christian Reed's a no main peddler either, no, actually, quite. in fairness. He's been around a long time, hasn't he? He and his father have uh, been long-time drivers in sports car racing and Porsches in Europe. But uh, Tracy Crone uh, and his two teammates, Nicholas Johnson and uh, Michele Rugolo, have done a fabulous job. They've kept that car clean, they knew that's, that's what they had to do. And they're actually running what would be eighth place in GT overall. So hats off to those guys. Just 13.6 seconds between Pagano in second in the 01 Highcroft and the 9 Peugeot of Frank Montani. Alan McNish yeah, but unwittingly <laughs> is pulling Montani close to... But McNish is up the road, actually. He's disappeared there. Mm. It's not in sight. He's cleared off. 50.4 last time around for Alan McNish. Fastest so he's man on the track. Away. Yeah, pulled away a, a second and a half over of this man, Frank actually, Montani. Not the fastest one on the track last time because that was Neil Yarny. I think he did it. Oh, no, no, that's no, a 56. No, no. Sorry. But Alexander Wurtz did a 50.9 in the number seven Peugeot in ninth position. And Lloyd Duval has been super consistent. He's oh, lost, been brilliant. Last four laps uh, 51.9, 51.3, 51.9, and 52.3 this time around on lap 321. We've had a relatively low, low number of retirements as well, Jeremy. So there's still the bulk of the 56 car field or 55 car that came to the green flag are still out there. Uh, there's a lot of debris on the track. You're very easy to make mistakes out there in the darkness. And Duval, well, I thought Hugh's attitude was absolutely superb. Didn't put a gun to his driver's head, said, look, everybody Action calm down. Right, well, he was fuel mixed to four before, and he's gone to fuel mixed to two. Is that leaning it off? Might, one might suggest so. Well, let's have a listen to him. We can stay with the on board. We'll listen to him at the end of the straight and see how, how deep he's taken that car into the corner. We'll look at lap time, 152.6 or 8, I think it was last time around. It's about, again, just about the same lap time as Frank Montagny. That gap from second to third is still, what, 13 and a half seconds, and that's about what it's been now for the last three or four or five laps. So I'm not sure whether 
one is the best and therefore two would be next to it or one is the leanest and therefore the least fuel yeah it's, it's frank montani's pace that's the interesting uh, aspect of this for me so 52s now he's not being held up by alan and she's no, had you know, clear pretty off. clear runs and he, and that those are the lap times he's doing consistently and you know they, that was a fresh set of tires they put on a, a, that that last pit stop there is kind of break frank montani he's pushing hard but you know if, it, if this is a if this is a super soft set of michelin tires maybe they're past their best now yeah he may have pushed just a little too hard in those opening laps rick de Bruyne is down in the peugeot sport pit and let's talk about three mistakes that have cost this peugeot team today the first had to do with those louvers on the front end if you weren't watching earlier they had some louvers that came loose as a result they had to change the nose it turned into a long change cost them an extra 25 seconds and then because of that pedro lami went out on cold tires thinking he had to do a little bit better spun it probably cost him another 25 seconds and then finally that very last mistake they made on their last pit stop cost him even more time three mistakes together probably cost him about a minute or so maybe a minute and a half and as a result they're going to lose the race on it maybe any any one of those Possibly. could have got them second place i'll, I'll certainly uh, go with that rick that's a very good point uh, i think they've uh, cost themselves certainly a crack at second place and then you've got to wonder what the team orders would have been between them and team Oric and matt Munt. yes it's not the same team but it is a peugeot satellite operation with uh, Hugh de Shonak, I'm sure he would uh, be horrified to hear me saying that, but effectively, this car is a Peugeot works car. It's not bought, it's been run by him. There is the car we're talking about. Striking new colour scheme. They had the Harlequin Diamond Mondrian esque paintwork last year. He is leading by 45 seconds. Simon Pagino has now only a dozen seconds between himself and Frank Montani. Yeah, but Mont Montani certainly isn't closing the gap. Uh, anything like what he needs to or the rate he was doing when he first came out of the pits on that fresh set of Michelin tyres. I think it's going to be close for second. I really do. The joker in the pack here might be Alan McNish because I still think he's between those two. There is Simon Pagino. Let's have a listen. Coming on to the Ullman straightaway right now, down towards turn 17. Here's the 055 leader coming into the pit lane, the LMP2 leader, Ryan Hunter Ray. I'm a bit disappointed with P2, I've got to say, I really didn't want to have to think that we were going back to the days of, well, the old days it was fast and fragile. Now it just seems to be fragile because the cars aren't quick at all. They've been slowed down to the point where the prototype challenge cars or the Formula Le Mans cars that are in Europe seem to be quicker. And uh, if they're going to be fragile as well, that's going to make for a very, very long race for the, those guys at Le Mans. 11 seconds now between Simon Pagino in second place and Frank Montagny in third place. That's 150.3 for Frank Montagny. So all of a sudden, he's found a big chunk of time on that lap. And conversely, Simon Pagino is in traffic. In traffic. But uh, 15 minutes to go, so what, seven or eight laps? And that could be critical in itself. Right, OK. Come on, Mr Shaw. Who... Duval, we think, will win this. He's got 41 seconds on Pagino. It would be tragic and disgraceful if team orders were, were brought into play for that will. kind of gap. I don't think it will. Ten seconds between pa Pagino and Montani. Has Simon got enough to hold him off? It's going to be down to fuel in the tank yes. more than anything else, isn't it? Pagino does a 51-4 in fuel-saving mode. That is outstanding driving by Simon Pagino. Come on, neck on the line. What was the question? Is Montani going to catch him? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think Simon's got enough uh, uh, up his sleeve just about to hold on. It won't be by a lot, uh, but uh, I think he's got it. I think he's just about got it in hand. As I said before, I still think McNish could be a factor in this. We need to spot the Audi. Oh, there it was. He is just going through. 
So McNish is still ahead and between the, the second and third place cars. Given that this is a seven round series for the ILMC, he will not want that number eight Peugeot to get any more points than it has now. It's under 10 seconds now, the gap from second to third is still going worse. It's still going to be close. It's uh, Montagny, if he could turn, it was a fit, 1 minute 53 that time around, so you know, the previous lap had been clear. And what's interesting to me well, actually, Simon Pagenaud was 154 that lap, but up until that lap, so we, we saw Simon actually coming up to some traffic, didn't he? He had to yeah. lift right off to get one of the GT Challenge class past one of the GTC cars at the far end of the racetrack, but you know, he's been super consistent, and uh, he's certainly been a lot more consistent than has the car number eight with Frank Montagny at the wheel. Respect Let's to... 12 hours we've been going almost now, and what, 54 seconds between the top three cars. I'd say that's pretty exciting. Respect to Lloyd Duval, who's done a great job in this last in, and, and in fairness, before him, we should say that uh, Nicolas Lapierre put them in a position to be able to make the choices that they have. He was outstanding. I said before that Lapierre doesn't often get uh, a lot of credit, but where it's due here... Olivia Panis doesn't seem to have done a lot of work in that car. I may be wrong. I'll have to look back at the stats afterwards. But I, no, I, I don't think he's done the kind of uh, heavy lifting that Lapierre certainly not has done. And that stint towards the end, as I say, certainly the consistency that Lapierre was rocking out in difficult conditions as in the sundown area. I think he's only done one stint actually, Olivia Panis. Yeah, hasn't driven the car since. Um, Quite the last six hours, I think. Lap 120. Lap 155, he last got out of the car. Oh, what's this red light on the dashboard? We haven't seen this before. Just uh, right in the middle of the dashboard, beside the kill switch, beside the fire switch. I haven't noticed that before. Let's hope that's not a fuel warning light. Let's have a look on the dashboard as well. I can see. And a bright yellow light in front of Simon as well, surely not. I'm guessing it's maybe a headlight switch or something like that. It looks to have a toggle underneath it. Oh, get hold up too oh much. dear me, traction control light flashing away there next to the gear selector. This is the light we're talking about. I can't remember seeing that before. I may be wrong. I, mean, I am tired. <laughs> 9.3 seconds he has over Frank Montagny. 11 minutes to go. You can't call it, can you? You just can't call it. The one on the steering wheel that you can see off behind the steering wheel has been for some time. Well, we're told that the light's been on for a while. We hadn't noticed it. That's fine. Forgive me if I'm trying to put more drama into a situation that possibly doesn't need it. <laughs> absolutely right there it's you know, it's a 151.9 again for Duval so he's back down to his pace last lap was a 153.5 a little bit more traffic than usual but you know very consistent by and large is Lloyd Duval you know he's uh, He's been around the sport a long time. He's, for, for most of the last 10 years or so, he's been racing in Japan, uh, both in uh, Formula Nippon and in sports cars over there, uh, and now making the move back to Europe and, and effectively, effectively world championship racing. Uh, but you know, the guy has a huge amount of experience and ability, and he's showing every bit of that all day long today, all week long, for Hugh de Schonach and Orica Team Matmut. Well, we're in the last 10 minutes underneath that mark now, and it's still Lloyd Duval who leads 43 seconds, but the battle is still raging for second place. Appreciate that some of you are listening and can't see the pictures that we've been talking about for a while, so don't forget... It's under eight seconds now. 12.30, <laughs> Eastern tomorrow here in the United States, ESPN on ABC for the highlights of the 59th annual Mobile One 12 Hours of Sebring presented by Fresh from Florida. 151, sorry, 151.5 yeah. for Frank Montagny, 153.1 for Simon Pagina. That gap is now below eight seconds. 7.747. 
That is the number. <laughs> the magic That's a good number. lap again for Lloyd Duval, 150.8 on that 327. Loic Duval may well unwittingly decide who gets second place here because it's going to depend when he comes round whether he's yeah. got two minutes to go or one minute 50 to yeah. go when they come round. That's right. To get the white flag. If it's, uh, I think if it's over about one minute 53, one minute 55, they won't throw the white flag. I think if it's 55 or under, they will. Yeah, it could well come down to that. And, There'll be a number in somebody's mind. It might be two minutes. It might be two minutes to yeah. go. There'll yeah. be a number in somebody's mind in race control. And that's absolutely critical because the Highcroft car stopped with, you know, with 50 minutes to go in the race. So if they've got to do 52 minutes, that's going to be a problem. No question about it. And that's why we've heard the, the, the calls from the radio from Rob Hill to Simon Pagano go to fuel mixture two or four or whatever it happens to be it's down to two now yeah now whether that's going up or down i would presume it's going down if they've got some fuel worries well they gave me a seat for sebring and the 12 hours this year and for the first time since i came here i've sat down for most of the race in fact for all by the first few laps but now i'm on the edge of it because this is Sports car racing in its absolute finest. Simon Pagano battling with the car, a brand new car. They don't know what this car's like in low, low fuel conditions. They don't know how much they're going to get picked up from the bottom of the tank. They don't know when it's going to run dry. There's so many unknowns about this. They got the car last Saturday. These guys are racing this car for the first time. The number eight of Frank Montani. All they know is they've got to push hard, and he's still got Alan McNish between him and the back of Simon Pagano, if you look into the distance, when we're looking at the 8th Peugeot, you'll see the very distinctive two red LED strips on the end plates of the R15++ disappearing down the other side. There's McNish. McNish is the white headlights, the second of the white headlights coming towards us now. And the first one was Pagano. So yeah, uh, there he goes. That's McNish turning in there. You can see the bright number two on the side of the car. There's a, those very distinctive rear wing tail lights that's Pagano oh my goodness me six and a half minutes to go Jeremy Sean John Hindoff ESPN3.com <laughs> so so McNish Ooh. and Montani are catching Simon Pagano <laughs> last lap around for McNish actually uh, he didn't actually put any time on Pagano 152.5 for Alan McNish 151.8 for Simon Pagano. So once again, Simon has answered the call there and he has extended that gap over Frank Montani by one second last time around. Now, here is a question about team orders because Peugeot might well be saying to you, Deshaunak, now, can you get Loic to push a little bit because we want an extra lap out of this? And they'll, they'll try and get him around so that he gets one more lap. It, that is something that they could ask him to do. He's got the fuel, we think now. We know he's got the fuel now to go at the end, and he's varying his lap times, obviously, within traffic, but he will control when the white flag is shown. Let's have a look when... Uh, see if I can see exactly when Duval crosses the line to complete this lap. We'll be lap 329, and therefore see how long there is to go on the clock before the end of the no. 12 hours. That was just it, gone it? through. So it's 24, 35, so we've got five minutes it to go. It was about 5.13. So it's three laps, basically. It's it was about 5.13 to go when he crossed the line. So you're talking just over, what, 10 miles, 11 miles of racing to go. We've seen races in the American Le Mans series decided way inside this, even at the head of the field. Yeah, it's awfully close for, for, for Highcroft racing. It really is. He's got to do 26 laps on this stint of fuel, I reckon. This was the final pit stop, and this is the Michelin move of the race. The early pit stop by Hugh de Shornak and the Orica team. They gave Loic Duval a full tank of sulfur-free clean diesel and allowed him to hold on to the lead and push it out to 45 seconds. Fantastic lap from Simon Pagano, 150.5 in the last two laps. He's taken time back out of Frank Manchani. <laughs> yeah, great stuff. 50.5, that's, that's a great job. Fastest man on the track at the moment. Best Alan McNish could do was a 50.9.
So in the last couple of laps, Simon has, has made some ground. Both of the last two laps, he's made ground on Frank Montagny. Apologies for completely ignoring everyone else in the race, but as you can imagine, at this, as we're on the old one at the moment, looking forward, that this is where the action is. Three minutes, 40 seconds to go. And it's all about the eight and the old one. And it's actually all about where the 10 car is on the track. Lord Deval in the 10. In last year's Peugeot. Once again, credit to the ACO for getting their sums right. A lot of people not, not really believing that all this balancing was going to work. He's crossed the line now. Three minutes and 25 as he went through. Here's the GT leader. We haven't really forgotten about you, Joey Hand and BMW. He's ahead of his teammate Dirk Werner by best part of a lap now. 56 from 55. What a race it's been for those guys. Well organized, well drilled, cool, calm, and collected. The problems they've had mainly by people running into them. But they're going to pull out a pretty impressive double here with Tommy Milner, former BMW driver, now with Chevy Corvette in the 03 car in third and the second of the Chevys in fourth position for Jan Magnussen, another could come back drive after that accident. And Tommy Milner still only 11 seconds behind Dirk Werner. Uh, that's the gap between second and third in GT2. In GT is just 11 seconds. Yeah, so no slip-ups uh, required from second place. The gap from first to second is 41 seconds. It's come down a little bit as Loic de Valle's eased his pace through the traffic. Oh, Hugh de Shornak. <laughs> He is sports car racing for me. I've seen him race all over the world. We've seen him here in the American Le Mans series with Orica, the Orica Vipers, of course, it's down through the years. It's going to be white flag. I think, yeah, it'll be white flag next time around, pretty sure. So that'll mean that Pagano has to do 26 laps on this stint of fuel. That's what he's exactly what he has done the last two stints. So that's how close it was. There's nothing in reserve at Highcroft Racing. White flag when the car comes to the line. This time we've got less than a lap of time to go. And that is very interesting because Loic de Val's just done two relatively slow laps. A 55 last time around, and as he takes the last lap, another 55. And look at the emotion. Look at the tension in the face of Hugh de Shornak of Orica. Great to see. Loic Duval in the venerable 908 HDI FAP has driven immaculately in this last stint, does any, everything his chef de keep has asked him to. Ably backed up by Nicola Lapierre. This is an Panny. Olivia Panny didn't do quite as much work no. this time around, but he's been part of Orica for so long, has Panny. And look at the emotion in the eyes and on the face of Hugh de Shornak. Simon Pagino goes across the line and pulled in five seconds. He did uh, that time around almost on Lloyd Duval, and the gap from second to third still 10 seconds. Pagino has saved just enough gasoline to make it to the end of the race. We hope we'll give you the class winners. We'll give them their due after the chequered flag. But this race is about Peugeot. This race is the first of the 2011 ELMS and the ILMC. And it's going to be a Peugeot that wins, but not perhaps the Peugeot that the script writers might have thought, particularly from France. Hugh de Shornak, single-seater, racing through the ages gt wins here gt wins at le mans but this is the first big outright race he's in tears on the pit wall and he is rightly proud of what he's achieved today this is one of the older cars beating the odds the aco have done it again they've managed to get the sums right they've done it more times right than wrong <laughs> Loic de Val goes ballistic as we have our first win of the season. Bravo, mon brave. Fantastic scene. Thoroughly well deserved. Nothing streaky about that at all. 
in GT. It's been a battle against adversity for Bobby Rahal's BMW Motorsport Squad with Joey Hahn taking it. Turn 24 hour in the Steam Reef 12 hour in two months. That's not bad. <laughs> it's not, it's bad, not at all. bad at all. And there goes Simon Pagano across the line. 31 seconds the deficit after 12 hours. Fantastic. Yeah, pulled it back in the last few laps as Louis Duval eased his pace. There is the battered but victorious 56 car. There is a veritable scrum by Hugh de Shornak. There's a lot of Frenchmen there who are going to have a very big hangover tomorrow. The checkered flag is out. The fireworks are on the way. We have our winners in class. Duval, Ryan hunter Cameron Joy Hand, and Damien Faulkner wins in GTC. The mobile won 12 hours of Sebring presented. was a town held captive by an evil gas pump. It fed on people's hard-earned money. But along came the Michelin Man, who reminded them the right tire changes everything. And with fuel-efficient tires in place, that evil gas pump wasn't so evil anymore. Michelin Energy Saver AS tires can help save up to 109 gallons of fuel. Michelin, a better way forward. Can changing your motor oil really change the world? Yep. Because this is not just another crude oil. This is new G oil. Ultimate biodegradable high performance oil. Made right here on our soil from renewable bio based sources. So it's time to make the change official. Because if G can race in the American Le Mans series, you can bet the Redwoods your car can run on it too. New G oil. Only from Green Earth Technologies. Get more at getg.com. I don't know what to say. I honestly don't know what to say. Loic Duval brings the car home for Hugh de Schoenach and Orica. And really any one of the top three could have deserved the victory. But all of them in their own way have got something to talk about. And yeah, there may be disappointment, Jeremy Shaw, that not everybody can stand on the top step of the podium. But in each and every case for the top three, they've all got something to celebrate. Absolutely right. I mean, that first major victory at the top class of sports car racing for Uta Schoenak and uh, Team Orica Matmut. Uh, a magnificent second place on that debut for Highcroft Racing's brand new HPD LMP1 car. And, you know, for the factory Peugeot team, hey, third place, it's a, it's a shakedown. It's the first run for a brand new car. This is exactly what they wanted. They just wanted to learn what they need to do to make this car a winner at Le Mans. That is their primary focus this season. Come away with a third place finish, be competitive all day long, they've got to be happy. And both Audis behind them. Yes. And both That's a bonus. Yes, it is. And, and you know, and both Works Peugeot's made it to the finish. There was a few problems for the number seven car, but there is Alex Works. He brings the car across the line in eighth place. Yeah, and even Audi in fourth and fifth position, not happy with that result, I bet, but it could have been a whole heck of a lot worse for those guys. They were so far down, we couldn't even see them on our second timing screen. Outside the top 34 at one stage, both of those cars. Great drive back by McNish and uh, Christensen and Dindo Capello, ably backed up by the younger driving squad of Duma and the rest of the guys. Here's the final results of the LMP1. These are all provisional, of course, till after tech. It's the Lapierre Duval and Panis number 10 Peugeot, the Matmut car that wins it. Great for them. And the 0-1 defending LMS champions, Brabham, Franchitti, Pagano in second place for Highcroft for HPD and for Nick Worth. Well done, guys. In third place, the first of the new P1 cars from Peugeot, the Diesel, Montani, Sarazan and Lamy, the eighth car in third position. Then the two Audis, the O16 Dyson with Chris Dyson, uh, Smith and Cochrane in that car in sixth position. That was a pretty good run for them as well. Not sure what to make of the uh, Gianni Prost and Blackamoreland run, the Rebellion car with the Toyota engine. They, th I think, will have wanted to do just a little bit better than that. Behind them, Alexander Wurtz, and then in uh, ninth position in the GT 
category you've got to go the G uh, the LMP1 category you've got to go a bit further down because it was only really the top eight who were running competitively at the end the usual media scrum at Sebring we've got all of our Pitlou reporters in there and we'll bring you the interviews with the winning drivers as soon as we can so don't go away here on ESPN3.com Lloyd Duval is in danger of being injured by his team who were giving him the bumps down there in the pit lane let's uh, head down to our pit lane crew they have literally got him off the ground that is an accident we're having down there I've never seen anything like it a lot of happy Frenchmen fantastic stuff the class winners again Dan Cameron uh, for the 0 c 6 uh, 3 6 general racing lmpc in ninth position uh, overall and only 20 laps off the lead at the end let's go down to jamie howe who is somewhere in that scrum i am right in the middle of all of the action on victory row louis duval talking to the team right now getting on top of the car so much congratulations giving himself a pat on the back there's so much action down here on pit lane right now i am not sure if we're going to be able to get him he's coming off the car Luik Duval, if someone would have said to you before the start of this race that you were going to come home victorious, would you have believed him? No, not at all. I mean, we didn't expect at all to be to be that quick and that lucky today. But at the end, you know, at the end, it's a it's a great achievement. But it, what we did today, I mean, it, it was tough, but it's great. What does this mean to Team Orca Matmut? It's great, you know, they came here. In the US, the one with the Viper and the edition we won with the Peugeot, it's fantastic. Look at that smile and look at, look at this team. So much excitement down here today. Hugh de Shonak, well done, man. Well done. In tears for the whole of the white flag <laughs> lap. And who says real men don't cry? That is what we like to see in sports car racing. Real passion from the heart. Yeah, there's, there's few people more passionate about the sport than used the show neck. Let's check the GT results. Had a great racing from them for pretty much all of the 12 hours. And even at the end, a change of position uh, in the last 40 minutes or thereabouts. It sees a good result for BMW. The two BMW Motorsport entered cars first and second. They were the hit of the weekend, but only for other people. That's what caused their problems. Good recovery drives from both of them and also from the Chevy Corvettes, the O3 car coming home on the podium in third place, backing up their great victory at the end of last season. The O4 car having to overcome their difficulties as well. The best of the Ferraris was the pole sitting car from AF Corsa. Could have been a little better for them. And the Flying Lizards, the O45 in sixth place. Rick De Brule. Down here with the GT winner, Joey Hand. Congratulations, you're now a Sebring winner for the first time. When the car had that flat early on, you weren't in it, but did you have doubts you'd be able to be here in Victory Circle? Oh, you do for sure, but these guys, I'll tell you, it all goes back to these uh, BMW, Ray Hall, Letterman, Landing guys, and BMW Motorsport. These guys worked so hard over the off-season to build two brand-new race cars. This car, when I got in it the first time, I told them this is a great car. I like it a lot. And uh, Monday when I got in, I said, we, we got a chance at this. I've been pushing hard. I won the Rolex 24. I won the 12 hour Sebring now. It's pretty crazy, but it's great to do it with this team because this BMW has been my home for a while and uh, we had some great Dunlop tires today. I could, I could go as hard as I wanted to go and uh, they just kept on keeping on with me. All right, a two hour stint at the very end of the race and Joey Hand comes away with the victory at Sebring in GT. It's a bit of talent there. Oh yeah. A bit of talent there, definitely. In uh, LMPC, Dan Cameron in the 036 from the 005, the court motorsports car of uh, Ryan DL at the end and uh, let's go down to Kelly with Ryan Hunter Ray and the whole level 55 crew chanting Ryan Ryan as he gets out of the car and and for Ryan Hunter Ray probably not the cleanest uh, win you've ever celebrated but what does it mean to get Scott Tucker his first LMP2 victory and to be paired up here with Luis Diaz well this is what uh, this is what endurance racing and Sebring 12 hours all about is uh, it's just endurance you know making it happen with this this team has done such an amazing job i've never seen a group of guys work so hard in such a short amount of time and to win here at the 12 hour with level five racing and and honda and michelin it's um man, it's a dream come true i'm a florida boy and i've always wanted to win this race and these guys made it happen so <laughs> congratulations second in p2 
for the debutants, another debutant team, the uh, Signatech Nissan, the Signatech uh, Nissan Orica, Frank Meyer bringing the car to the end. Let's have a look at the GTC results, and this makes great reading for us because we've got some friends in here as well. The 054 of uh, Black Swan Racing with Damien Faulkner qualifying the car and doing a great j job in the middle to get the lap back. He becomes the first Irishman since Derek Daly, something like 20 years ago, to win a class or anything indeed here at Sebring. We know Derek Daly was watching on ESPN3.com. The 066 coming through into second place and the 030, well, they had a four-minute stop and go penalty. How much different could their day have been without that? Tremendous job too, and also a good debut for JDX racing their fourth place. They just missed the podium. It was close. Let's go down to Jamie, who has the GTC winner. Tim Pappas, coming in, you're defending your 2010 GTC championship. You had to work hard for this 12-hour win. What does it mean to the team? Oh, it means so much. Everyone from Black Swan, we worked so hard. We had the, such a hard week this week. Sebring just knows how to beat you up, spit you out, and here we are, we, win, we won. So I'm so proud of the guys. It's really, this is all about the team, Black Swan Racing. Great job for everyone. Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations. Congratulations. Happy man, and well done, Faulkner. Here's the confirmation of what we were telling you earlier on. This is LMPC with... Genoa Racing, the 036 car from the two core cars, second and third. That'll be a party to go to as well later on. And well done to the 063 coming through to fourth position after they had problems earlier on. Elton Julian, remember, having that off and uh, after an accident, an incident with another car. Johnny Morlam didn't have a great day in terms of results. Sixth position, but he was quick when he was in the car and eventually a broken floor put them out after a fire. Uh, but Morlam still got the speed. Yeah, great result there for General Racing. Came away with a first and a fourth, and as you say, Core Autosport second and third on their debut at this level. Fabulous job. With the X Level 5 cars, so that's been cars. a good, good day for Scott Tucker. As you can see, the podium ceremonies are beginning to get underway. With the Peugeot team, including Hugh Dishonak, on the extreme left, up with his drivers there, and rightly so. Yes, yeah, it's been a textbook victory for those guys. I mean, they've they've planned their strategy perfectly. They were a little bit short. They knew they were going to a little bit be a little bit short on fuel. Nothing they could do about that. So they just did. They just focus on the job at hand. Make sure they didn't make any mistakes. Make sure they make their final pit stop just to ensure they weren't caught out in case there was a late co full course caution period. And they came away with the victory, having barely put a. I can't remember doing anything wrong all day long can you plan your strategy yeah. and then execute it you know Absolutely. you can't ask for anything more than that doesn't matter what your sport is basketball football hockey or motor racing plan out what you're going to do play to your strengths and then make it happen make as few mistakes as possible and that must have been their mantra today because they've absolutely delivered on that the margin of victory at the end 31 32 seconds but really, it wasn't in doubt for the last 40 minutes when they did absolutely the right thing and brought the car in the moment they knew they can get enough fuel in it to get it to the end of the race because it, and it's a European team. Of course, they sometimes don't read the strategy calls, but Hugh's been over here with Orica Vipers so many times. They dominated the GT1 classes. I think they pretty much know how to work the yellow flag rules, and it seemed that it worked for them today. There's the car right in the middle of the victory road there with uh, the GTE amateur car the Crone racing car that's a nice victory for them Tracy Crone has been third at Le Mans in the GT2 class as it was then now he's got to stand on the top of the podium at another classic sports car race he'll be hoping that he can repeat this in June relatively new team with the kinetic organization of Nick Johnson yeah yeah they're used to running cars in you know in uh the uh, Rolex series as well, so you know it's they've got a lot of experience in that team. David Brown is the chief engineer. He's he spent many years in Formula One. Uh, they they develop cars, they've designed cars, they've run cars, and uh, you know it's a, it's a championship-winning organisation already. So no surprise they'd be running up front. And in the, we've managed to find the LMPC winner, Dan Cameron, who did a fabulous job today. Rick Tabiru. 
Not easy finding them, but a lot tougher getting to Sebring's Victory Circle. Congratulations, Dane Cameron. Let's talk about your day. And, you know, we always ask, did you expect to be here? No one truly expects, but you sure hope. Yeah, that, that was a pretty picture-perfect run for, uh, for Sebring. I mean, just big, big, big thank you to Genoa and all the guys working so hard. I mean, no mechanical problems whatsoever the whole time. Just fall, so we just clicked off laps all day, which is exactly what we came here to do. Just a little on the conservative side, just be a little safe through traffic. And, you know, nobody made any big mistakes. Pit stops were all great, and it was just a, a perfect plan, and, and it worked out well. And we were up front all day. I think we led, I don't know, probably at least half of the race. So it was fantastic to be on pole and then to win the, win the race. And all three of our first starts in the 12 hours is, is just phenomenal. I was going to say, I mean, Towards the end, the day's been going so well. You've led for so much. Do you start hearing those noises in the car at the end? Yeah, the guys are making me a little bit nervous. We were about maybe 30 minutes from the end, and they're like, okay, you don't need to go that fast anymore. You can kind of bring it back. I'm like, why? What's, going, what's wrong? They're like, oh, we need to save a little bit of fuel. So it's pretty tough to save fuel when you don't can't adjust the map. So they're making me a bit nervous, but uh, uh, nothing besides that. We tried not to think too much about what was going on and just try to work the laps down, and we made it. So very happy. Dane Cameron, a Sebring winner. Yeah, big smile, as you can imagine, very happy. The celebrations will go on deep into the night here at Sebring. Everyone who's got to the end of the race will have plenty of stories, almost a whole season of motor racing anecdotes, all in half a day here at Sebring. Now, don't forget tomorrow, all the highlights, 12.30 Eastern, ESPN on ABC. The Mobile One 12 Hours of Sebring, presented by Fresh from Florida. If you haven't seen us then don't forget, you can see it there. And follow the series to Long Beach in April on ESPN2 and ESPN3.com. Live coverage of Friday afternoon qualifying on April the 15th and on ESPN3.com. We'll be streaming the race on Saturday, April the 16th in the evening time. Then check out the race on ESPN2 on Sunday, April the 17th, 5 till 7 p.m. Eastern, the American Le Mans series on ESPN. Well, we've opened the dawn of a new digital era. 13 years ago, when we first put audio on the web, people said we were mad. Today, it's been in vision and in HD. On behalf of Kelly Stavis, Jamie Howe, Rick DeBrule, and Jeremy Shaw alongside me, thanks for being with us at the Mobile One 12 Hours of Sebring, presented by Fresh.